Buenos días a todos. Vamos a comenzar este, este acto. Eh, lo primero, dar la bienvenida a todos los presentes y al, y al profesor Ronner. Eh, agradeceros vuestra asistencia, también a los que nos pueden estar escuchando por, eh, por Teleunez. Eh, soy Laura Méndez, vicedecana de esta facultad. Estoy en nombre del decano, que no ha podido, siente mucho no haber podido asistir por un compromiso anterior. Y quiero agradecer al profesor Carrasco y a su departamento que nos dé la oportunidad de tener eh, al profesor Roner con nosotros eh, para dar esta conferencia que eh, segura será de, interés, de gran interés para todos. Bueno, voy a decir unas, unas breves eh, palabras para presentar muy brevemente el currículum que desde luego es muy extenso e importante de este, de este profesor. Él es profesor emérito de la Universidad de Connecticut en el Departamento de Desarrollo Humano y Estudios sobre Familia. Se doctoró en 1964 en Antropología Psicológica en la Universidad de Stanford. Su principal centro de interés académico ha sido el estudio de las relaciones de aceptación, rechazo y sus repercusiones en el contexto familiar desde una perspectiva transcultural, psicológica y antropológica. Entre sus numerosos méritos como docente e investigador, cabe destacar que es presidente fundador de la Sociedad Internacional sobre la Aceptación y el Rechazo. Además, es director de Centro para el Estudio de la Aceptación-Rechazo Interpersonal. Obtuvo el premio de la APA en el 2004 por su contribución al desarrollo de la psicología internacional. Y, por supuesto, tiene una elevada productividad científica en numerosas revistas especializadas. Y es colaborador en el Departamento de Personalidad y con el profesor Carrasco en numerosos trabajos en, en nuestra facultad, de lo cual creo que en nombre de todos y, de la, y del decanato en particular nos congratulamos de esta, de esta colaboración. Muy bien, muchas gracias señora vicedecana. Muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí. Eh, buenos días y muchas gracias también a todos aquellos que están a través de Internet eh, presenciando esta, esta conferencia. Para mí es una gran satisfacción y una gran eh, alegría, incluso estoy un poco emocionado, eh, que el profesor Ron esté hoy con, con, con nosotros y sobre todo que haya aceptado la invitación pa, para, para estar aquí. Y también, sobre todo, que nos haya dejado ser parte de su grupo internacional de, de investigación, lo cual a mí me hace sentir pues, muy, muy orgulloso. Eh, bueno, además de destacar su imparable e ingente productividad que todos vosotros pueden eh, eh, consultar en, en, en la web, solo metiendo su nombre en Google podrán ver eh, su trayectoria y también su productividad. Sí que a mí eh, me gustaría, además de lo que la señora vicedecana ha destacado, sí que me gustaría también destacar los temas en los que él ha trabajado y en los que actualmente está trabajando un poco para que vean el alcance de, de su trayectoria y de su productividad. Eh, él, eh, desde aproximadamente los años 60, eh, propuso y construyó u, una teoría basada en la, en la evidencia sobre las relaciones de aceptación y rechazo interpersonal y cómo estas relaciones afectan en el ajuste psicológico del niño y, y, y del adulto ¿no? a lo largo de todo el, el desarrollo. Además de esto, eh, desarrolló una batería de, de instrumentos para poder eh, poner eh, a prueba eh, su teoría y instrumentos, eh, muchos de los cuales nosotros hemos traducido ya en español y estamos en proceso de, de adaptación con su, con su colaboración. Eh, otra gran aportación que, que le ha hecho ha sido el análisis de todas estas relaciones desde una perspectiva transcultural. Si ustedes eh, analizan su productividad científica verán que sus tesis han sido probadas en diferentes culturas eh, eh, y en diferentes momentos, ¿no? lo cual yo creo que es también un elemento eh, eh, a destacar. Y eh, otro elemento que yo destacaría es eh, el análisis que él ha hecho de, eh, de la experiencia de sentirse aceptado, rechazado sobre el desarrollo del apego a lo largo de toda la vida, no solo en el niño, sino también cómo esas relaciones de apego luego influyen en, 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 la, edad, eh, en la edad adulta. <coughs> Bueno, y todo esto en la actualidad pues lo está eh, extendiendo a la violencia intrafamiliar, a las relaciones con los compañeros, a, con los amigos, con los abuelos y para todos estos campos está desarrollando también instrumentos 
con la, la idea de poner a prueba sus, sus tesis. Bueno, pues yo creo que con, con esto, para no eh, tampoco eh, eh, sobrecargaros de información, va, eh, voy a darle la palabra para que eh, eh, pueda, eh, pueda hacer su, su ponencia. La ponencia estará dividida en dos partes. La primera de ellas hablará sobre los beneficios del afecto dado y recibido, tal y como aparece en el título, y eh, la otra parte, pero que en realidad la va a ir entremezclando, eh, va a hablar de eh, la evidencia que ha obtenido a través de metaanálisis con esas tesis que él, que, él, que él defiende. Al final, como siempre de la ponencia, habrá un tiempo para, para preguntas, que yo os animo a que, a que la hagáis. Eh, había pensado que María José, si las queréis hacer en español, las preguntas la profesora González, una compañera, no ha llegado todavía, pero llegará, eh, se ha ofrecido a traducir la, las preguntas al inglés, si alguno de vosotros tiene alguna dificultad o simplemente, eh, bueno, le, le da reparo, ¿no? Así que, por mi parte, eh, nada más agradeceros de nuevo también a la señora vicedecana que haya podido hoy estar aquí, agradeceros a todos vosotros eh, vuestra asistencia, os animo a que hagáis preguntas y si no queréis aquí, después podéis eh, con, eh, mantener preguntas con el profesor Roner, es una persona bastante allegada y, en fin, cercana, o sea que no hay ningún problema. So, uh, Professor Roner, thank you so much for being here. Uh, welcome to our university. Um, now is your time, is your time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the very gracious and, and complete, I think, uh, introduction. I have to say, uh, I think complete because I speak very little Spanish. So, in fact, they could have been talking about what they had for breakfast, but I, I, I had uh, suspicion that it was much more than, than that. <clears throat> so I want to talk today um, about a topic that you are all very familiar with, that you already know uh, a great deal about, uh, and that's you. And I think that, however, that I'm going to be able to say some things about you uh, that perhaps you didn't know before. So I want to invite you to think about yourself in everything that I say. And think about the people that are most important to you in everything that I say. I'm working from what we call parental acceptance rejection theory. If the theory is as powerful as we think it is, it works as well for you and me as individuals as it does for the approximately 100,000 other people that we've worked with uh, on every continent now except for the Antarctic. Uh, no people in the Antarctic. We haven't figured out yet what to do with the penguins there. Uh, and we've, we've worked uh, with uh, across uh, all the languages and cultures and, and races and geographies and genders uh, of the world. And we have come to two major conclusions. Actually, my, my lecture today could be very short. Uh, I could uh, say what I have to say in less than five minutes. However, uh, I've been encouraged to speak for at least an hour. And professors are supposed to profess, so that's what I intend to do. Uh, we work, as I say, from parental acceptance rejection theory. It really should be uh, called interpersonal acceptance rejection theory, except for the fact that I started doing this work in 1960, and it wasn't until about 1980 that uh, we actually identified it. As, uh, we had done enough research to be able to call it a theory, because parental acceptance re rejection theory, and let me call it PAR theory uh, for short. That's what we, the way we usually designate it is an evidence-based theory of socialization and lifespan development. Uh, it's intended to be able to say some things about the consequences and the causes and other correlates of interpersonal acceptance and rejection for people every place in our planet. So uh, unlike American psychology, when I first started in psychology in the, in the uh, uh, 19, early 1950s, uh, psychology was primarily based on uh, middle class, upper middle class, white, European American students, 18 to 20 year old students taking the 
introductory course in psychology in fulfillment of their undergraduate distribution requirements, and that was what pretty much what the totality of psychology was about. For me, that was not satisfying, as it turned out, after um, a year that I spent in North Africa uh, with a totally different uh, cultural framework, sights, sounds, smells, and whatnot, just across the straits here uh, from Spain uh, in Morocco. Uh, and that changed my life forever. Uh, and that made me uh, committed to the idea of understanding what we're like as human beings. And so I've committed my entire adult life uh, to, to trying to do that, but always from the point of view of the issue of love, the kind of love that parents can give or not give to their children and the effects of that, and more recently, the kind of caring love, whatever term you care to use, that intimate partners, adult partners, can give or not give to each other, and what happens to us when we get our needs met or not met in relationship with the people that are most important to us, our attachment figures, throughout the lifespan. I'm going to focus primarily today on this piece of PAR theory in the upper left-hand corner called personality sub-theory. And it asks uh, two major questions. There are three sub-theories to PAR theory that uh, ask five major questions about what we're like as human beings. The personality sub-theory asks about, uh, is it true that children, every place in our species, regardless of differences of race, language, culture, gender, other, other defining conditions, do we respond in the same way uh, when we get our needs met, when we feel accepted or rejected by the people that are most important to us? By the way, the answer to that is yes. And do uh, the effects of rejection uh, extend on into adulthood? Is it a, a lifespan uh, a issue that we have to deal with? Again, the answer is yes, unequivocally yes. Our childhood can bully us for the rest of our lives. I'm going to go into the details about that uh, in a moment. Another part of a the theory that I'll be talking about in the, very briefly in the upper right-hand corner is coping theory. We've learned that about 80% or more of people in every sample, every population of the world that we've worked in so far, respond exactly the way the theory predicts. A very small percentage of those people do not. And we have discovered that, that some people have the resilience to stand up under the corrosive drizzle of day-to-day. -day. I'm going to use the terms acceptance and rejection. I'm going to define those for you. So at the moment, just bear with me and let me use the term who can stand up to the day-to-day -day, uh, drizzle of uh, parental hostility, aggression, and so forth without buckling the way that most of us do when we feel rejected by our parents when we're children or by our partners when we're adults or other kinds of attachment figures uh, throughout the lifespan. I will spend a little bit of time today uh, amplifying on this coping process or what we call coping sub-theory. The one here at the bottom, sociocultural systems model, is, not, is something I'm not going to have time <clears throat> to talk very much about today, but it asks questions about why are some parents warm and loving for their children and other parents not. In about 25% of the societies of the world, parents behave in ways that fit the defi theoretical definition of rejection. That's the culturally normative way of behaving toward kids. That's the negative side. On the positive side, 75% of the world Parents in 75% of, uh, of the world are more or less loving toward their children. It has nothing to do with profound poverty or wealth. It has very little to do, I should say, with profound poverty or wealth or everything in between. Uh, some of the most loving people that we have ever worked with were dying of starvation uh, in India in the 1980s, uh, and they were the untouchables, or what they used to be called untouchables. Uh, in India. Profound par poverty and other kinds of problems, but great love and warmth and affection with, uh, with their children. But I, 
And the, another issue about uh, in what we call sociocultural systems, model and theory, says, well, what else in a society is related to the experiences of being cared about or not? For example, are your beliefs about God, if you believe in God, are they related to the kind of experiences that you had as a child? And the answer tends to be yes. People who grew up in loving families tend to view God as being benevolent, warm, loving, supportive, positive in some way. Children who grow up in rejecting families tend to view God as being more malevolent, hostile, aggressive, capable of bringing unhappiness into your life, uh, illness, misfortune, and so forth. There's a worldwide tendency, again, across religions, across Christianity, Islam, and, and so forth, the major religions of the world, that despite whatever the scriptures of that religion may say, individual beliefs vary according to the kinds of life experiences that you and I have had as children. Now, I started out by saying that I could make this a very short lecture today. And what I would say if I had to make this a very, very short one would say, if you want to leave in the next five minutes, then I want you to leave with two messages. One, people every place on the planet understand, we understand ourselves to be cared about or not cared about in exactly the same way. There are at least four ways that this happens, and I'm going to talk about those four ways in a moment. And I'm going to ask you to think about your own life your experiences that you had when you were kids growing up with your mothers and fathers. I want to ask you to think about your current experiences with your intimate partners, if you have an intimate partner or past partners, and other people in, in your life, and find yourself somewhere on this, what we call the warmth dimension, of feeling more or less accepted or rejected by these very important people, our attachment figures. And then once you found yourself there, you will find yourself also in the second major conclusion that we draw, and that is children and adults, every place in the world, so far, without exception, anywhere in any culture, language, and so forth, respond in exactly the same way when they experience themselves to be accepted or especially rejected by their attachment figures. And there is a specific cluster of things that starts to happen to you and me. So let me, now, so the message, the bottom line message is we understand ourselves to be loved in the same way. There are at least four ways, perhaps others, we don't know yet, but at least four. When we feel ourselves, our need, our very powerful need that we have for positive response from the people that are most important to us, when those needs are not met, we seem to be wired as human beings to respond in exactly the same way. A cluster of seven to ten specific things, and perhaps more, but at least seven to ten things that happen to all of us. Now, if you need to leave, that's the bottom line message. I want you to walk away with those two points. If you care to stay longer, then let me tell you what the evidence is and, and more about how this uh, process works. Well, I guess I'm, my slides here, I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself in terms of the slides. Well, so we have these four classes of behavior, and we talk about the psychological adjustment of children and adults and people responding in the same way. Now, I've used these terms acceptance and rejection and warmth and so forth. Let me tell you what they mean to us, at least, in PAR theory, parental acceptance and rejection theory. And I want you to I invite you to think about yourself now. Think about somebody specific who is very important 
in your life. Your mother, your father, if you want to reflect back to your childhood, your, your, your current or former or whatever uh, attachment, uh, relationship, intimate partner, other people that may have been or might be very important to you. Where do you fall on this continuum? You and I are not either accepted or rejected categorically. We all fall somewhere along this dimension. Called the, we call it the warmth dimension. The warmth dimension of parenting, the warmth the dimension of interpersonal relationships. Everywhere in the world we have found so far, and I always have to say so far because there's always possible that we'll come across some population that doesn't respond. But I must tell you that so far, I've been, we've been doing this for over 50 years with, we, I, don't, I can't count the, the, how many, but we know that there are more than 100,000 people that we've worked with, or we meaning not, not just us in our, in our center and lab and whatnot, but, but uh, here in Spain, uh, Professor Carrasco and colleagues and whatnot and, and elsewhere around the world provide the, the data that I'm going to be uh, uh, summarizing uh, today. So, four ways, or at least four ways. How warm and affectionate do you find that your partner or your parent or your attachment figure to be? Or alternatively, how cold and unaffectionate? Because being the experience of, interpersonal experience of coldness and lack of affection is one of the four expressions that the rejection process can take. And it shows itself in a variety of physical and verbal forms and sometimes purely symbolic forms. Going back to India, for example, and the, when I talked about the, uh, the untouchables, it used to be called untouchables. They were called that when I was working in India in, in the early 1980s, in the late 1970s. I was sitting on a veranda uh, interviewing with my interpreter, uh, one of the high caste women. And next to her uh, was a mother who was sitting there very passively, not saying anything, but she had an orange in her hand, and she was peeling the orange. And then as moments went by, I saw that she was breaking this orange up into segments. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye, because I was focus focusing on my interview with this one mother, but I saw in the corner of my eye on the veranda what was going on over here. And I saw that she was taking the seeds out of each segment and putting them, the segment, in her daughter's mouth. And as this episode unfolded, I saw that her daughter was becoming increasingly excited. It, it was clear that something was going on, but I didn't know what it was. And when I was finished with the interview, my uh, interpreter, my cultural guide, you might say, Dr. Manjusi Chaki Sirkar, asked me, did you notice what was going on beside you during this interview? I said, yes, I, I saw it, but what, you know, she said, that's the sort of thing that you should pay attention to. That's why you're here. That's what you want to study. Here you saw a purely symbolic expression of love and caring. Because in that cultural context, the mothers, the young wives, are from the moment they get up until late in the evening, they are working very hard. They don't really have time to sit and peel an orange, segment an orange, take the seeds out of the orange, and feed it segment by segment to their child. And when they do that, the children know, every Bengali child knows that mother has done, or father, but in this case it was mother, has done something very special. This is a symbolic expression of love on the part of the mother. So it isn't just things that you can hear, and it isn't just, you know, feel. It isn't just expressions of physical and verbal. It can be purely symbolic, because 
and, and the culture comes in here because if I were to take an orange with my son or daughter at, at the age that this young girl was, if I were to peel the orange, segment the orange, take the seeds out of it and hand it segment by segment, I'd say, Dad, I, I don't want that. What are you doing? You know, it would ha not have any meaning of, of the same kind that it had in that cultural context. So culture comes in a great deal. And culture is some, or the, the expression of uh, love or lack of love is really symbolic. It's what you feel. And so in part theory, we focus almost exclusively, not exclusively, it depends on what your point of view is, but uh, we focus enormously on perception. How do you perceive this relationship? Doesn't make any difference what somebody else is saying about what's going on in your relationship with that very per important person to you. It's what you feel about your relationship and the quality of that relationship that impacts your life and mine. So the four ways then that parents can express, and I'll focus uh, a fair amount on rejection because we know that if a child is rejected, feels rejected, or an adult feels rejected by a partner or other important powerful person in your life, that it's, it's going to have a specific effect, a known and identifiable effect. Feeling loved does not necessarily predict as well as feeling rejected. So for that reason, I'm going to focus a lot on, on the rejection, but, but, but understand that I do that only because uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the press of time and trying to say everything that I want to say today, I'm going to focus on the stuff that's easy. I, d I don't have time to go into the more nuanced things about the, the love, but, uh, but I prefer to talk about love. I prefer to hug, prefer to do that sort of thing than, than to do the other end of it. But if we're talking about rejection, and there are four ways here, at least these four, that people, we have not found any population so far, any place in the world, that finds it difficult to identify themselves in terms of how warm and affectionate or cold and unaffectionate their intimate, their, their partner is or their parent is how hostile and aggressive that person might be, how indifferent or neglecting that person might be, or how what we call undifferentiated rejecting that person might be. Now, undifferentiated rejection is, is something that you can't feel it, hear it, smell it, taste it, and so forth. It's purely perceptual. It's your feeling about your relationship with that person. Mom doesn't love me. Dad doesn't care about me. My partner doesn't want me without necessarily having any objective indicators that the person is aggressive, neglecting, cold, unaffectionate toward you. Somebody else may say that, you know, those things just aren't there, but you feel it. Well, that's the fourth way that we have found that people can understand themselves. Now, are there other ways? We don't know. If they're there, we haven't identified them yet. So I, I suspect that, you know, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to try to say that we've closed doors on all the ways that people can un understand themselves to be cared about, but these, these four are very powerful. Now, I hope that you've thought about yourself and the person or people that are most important to you. I hope that you've placed yourself somewhere on this dimension. Now, let me tell you something about what you're experiencing in all likelihood, depending on where you fall on this. We found that, that all over the world, there are at least these seven things that start to happen to us. Actually, we now talk about 10, but the ones that we've done the, the greatest amount of research on it started, this, these seven started back in, we started with them in the 1970s. The other three have come in more, more recently, and I'll talk about those in a moment. But think about yourself now, because many of us have experienced some form of rejection in our lives. Or actually it can be something as simple as just being ignored in a, 
uh, in, a, in a kind of a, a party setting, somebody that, that, that you know that you think should be relating to you or you would like to have relate to you simply ignores you. Being spurned, ignored, and all these other things and all the social psychological experiments that have been done uh, on this show very much the same kind of thing, but not as intensely and not in for the <clears throat> to the same extent and to the same length as people who experience rejection at the hands of parents. Anger. Anger is one of the first things that starts to happen to us. We get hostile, aggressive, angry. We have fantasies, aggressive fantasies, daydreams, night dreams, and so forth. And it can, can, can kind of haunts us a little bit. Uh, Sometimes people who, who are rejected find themselves migrating toward or having a, a fascination to, uh, for uh, aggressive movies and violence uh, in the newspaper and stuff like this. A whole variety of things. By the way, much of what I'm talking about today, those of you who are in some practice-oriented or will be in some practice-oriented uh, profession, clinical, social work, educators, working with the courts, and so forth. These are things that you need to know. Because uh, the major uh, in the United States, we hear it said, not infrequently, that 80% or more of clients who come in for therapy of one kind or another are experiencing, they're there because of relationship problems. Well, you better know something about some of the things that I'm, that I'm saying, because if you know them, you can anticipate some of the kinds of problems that they're going to have that your clients may not even be fully aware of yet. So you're ahead of your clients sometimes for this and, and reasons that I'll be, I'll be, things that I'll be talking about. So anger, impaired self-esteem. We, we start thinking not as well, as not as positively about ourselves if we're rejected. And sometimes it's, oh my God, it's my fault. Uh, I'm not a very good person because this person who's so important to me doesn't like me, doesn't want me, doesn't appreciate me, doesn't want, you know, and so on, whatever, the, whatever, that, whatever those feelings are. And then when we start feeling badly about ourselves in terms of our self-esteem, we start feeling badly in terms of our sense of adequacy, our competence. Self-adequacy has to do with how competent do we feel that we are to deal with the kinds of problems that we have to deal with at the day-to-day -day level. Simple little things, taking care of, 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 of issues that come along. And if you feel like you're not very good at this relationship, then it tends very often, not always, but tends very often to say, I'm not very good at, and whatever it is. Self-adequacy, our sense of competence, it impacts negatively on our sense of competence. So we have our feelings about ourselves in terms of esteem, we have our feelings about ourselves in terms of our competence, and it goes on. Seriously rejected children, and, but, uh, and adults too, but, but to a, I'm going to focus a lot on kids, not just because it's called parental acceptance rejection theory, but, uh, but in part also because if a child is seriously rejected for a long period of time, depending on how long and what form and so forth it takes. So I can't go into, you know, obviously in the time that we have here, I can't go into all the nuances of this. But if you know that a child has been rejected, that is likely to have, it's going to be a better predictor of outcome for kids than it is for adults who are in a relationship, that, of rejecting relationship. It'll still have these effects that tend not to be as long lasting and they tend not to be uh, as, as, uh, as severe, but they're still there. Or adults reflecting, adults' current psychological adjustment, because all of these things collectively add up to what we call psychological adjustment. This cluster, this specific cluster of things that you see on the, on the screen behind me are one of the major measures that we have, uh, concepts that we have of, of psychological adjustment. So adults reflecting back on their childhood tend to be maladjusted if they <clears throat> feel rejected, but usually not to the same extent because typically what happens with, a lot of, with most people is that you and I experience enough other positive things in our life as we grow older to help us overcome 
some of these negative effects that we, that we find with children. Some of them, to some degree, but they're still there. They're lurking behind a great deal of what we experience uh, in ourselves. Emotional unresponsiveness. And think about yourself now. To what extent do you find yourself, be, find it easy to get into warm, loving relationships with other people that are important to you? Or do you find yourself being a little wary, being a little careful, being watchful for the possible signs that that person who's so important to you really might do something that, that you've experienced before, consciously or unconsciously, called rejection. And that you find that you, don't, you can't get as close to that person. Now, you probably have all experienced someone in your life at some point along the way where that person will let you get close to them, but up to a point. And then beyond that point, they'll often do something that will break that relationship or rupture that relationship because it gets too scary for that person, that rejected, that person who had been rejected. It, the, it gets too scary to let somebody in close enough because they might get hurt again. Keep that point in mind as I talk about another concept here coming up shortly called defensive independence. Emotional instability. The rejected child or adult tends to have more difficulty than people who grew up in loving context of uh, maintaining their, their emotional equilibrium in the context of stress. So they, they are more likely to become upset if, if, if something happens that, that, that they didn't want to happen in their life. You go out in the morning to start your car because you want to get to the office and your battery is dead. How do you handle that emotionally? What happens to you? You get very upset and angry and, and, and so forth, or do you, are you more uh, philosophical about it? And say, oh, uh, boy, what am I going to do now? You know, the rejected person tends to be, have difficulty managing those kinds of things, emotional instability, more likely to get upset, uh, uh, whatever the form of upset might be, crying or getting angry or, or, or so forth. All of this hurt, all of this pain that is associated with, with the rejection process, universally, across our species, apparently, associated with the rejection process, tends to get into our head, our mind, and we begin to think about the world as being unsafe, insecure, to some degree, unsafe, insecure, hostile, whatever it might be, it's the, the, your sense of reality is, is, is a negative one. And given that fact, it's no surprise, it's a very simple leap to go from your image of what life in the world is really like to saying what God is like. God becomes a, a hostile or potentially hostile and aggressive and can bring unhappiness, misfortune, childlessness, and whatever other kinds of unhappy things in your life can, can do that. That's an extension of this concept of negative worldview. Now, everything that I've said up to this point tends to be a linear relationship. The more rejected we feel by the people that are really important to us, kind of step by step by step, the more maladjusted we tend to become in each one of these things in a linear way. The angrier we are, the more impair impaired our self-esteem is, and so forth. The only one that is not linear is the issue of dependence or defensive independence. And here's what seems to be happening. All of us have a very powerful need, recognized or unrecognized, so the theory says, par theory, we have the need for positive response from the people that are most important to us. We have the need to feel cared about for nurturance, for support, whatever word you want to use for love. 
that's built into us as a, as a species. But when we don't get those needs met, then there's a tendency to increase your effort. Like a young child, mommy love me, mommy hold me up, mommy pick me up, and stuff like that. Those are, those are expressions of dependency, searching for, yearning for, wishing for, reaching out for response, has positive response, but only up to a point. After a while in the rejection process, it becomes too painful to keep trying. And that's what we have up here at the apex. You'll notice that it's a curve. And after a while, with the anger that starts coming in, and the impaired self-esteem, and the emotional unresponsiveness, and the cluster of other things that we've been talking about, what happens to us is that we tend to wrap our emotions in cotton. We, tend, we, want, we need to protect ourselves. We have to protect ourselves from the pain of more rejection. So it looks, and they quit making bids for response. The yearning is there, recognized or unrecognized. The need is there, recognized or unrecognized. But the behavior isn't there of the dependency. So it looks like the rejected child is becoming, or adult who had been rejected, looks like that person is becoming independent, making fewer and fewer bids for this kind of thing, verbally, symbolically, physically, whatever form it might take. But it's what we call defensive independence, because that person is, is hurting. And what they're trying to do now they're making fewer bids because it's too dangerous to keep trying. It hurts too much. You might get smacked again. You might get rejected again, and it's not worth taking that chance. And with adolescence, very often, it's you get a kind of a chip on your shoulder. Young children, you don't find it quite as much. But as they get into middle childhood and adolescence, we find it sometimes. It's, in effect, to hell with you. I don't need you. I don't need anybody. Uh, it's, it's you just build this wall and you keep people away from you because uh, it's, it's so dangerous that you might get rejected again. It shows us something about the power of this need that we have for positive response from other people that are so important to us. So it's a curvilinear kind of thing. It, with rejection, it increases, the dependency tends to increase, and, but up to, only up to a point, and that point varies from individual to individual. Some people have more tolerance than others for it. And then beyond a certain point, it starts to come down, given the appearance of independence, but it's not a normal, healthy independence. There's another message in here. And that is, the concept of dependence or dependency is very often thought of in negatively. You say you don't want your children to be negative, you don't want your children to be dependent, or you don't want your partner to be dependent. Well, that is really a, a, a false position about what we're like as human beings, because a normal, healthy person is a person who is capable of dependency to a certain degree, i.e., Ex being able to express the need for care, for comfort, for nurturance, for being appreciated, for being wanted, and so forth. It's the unhealthy, the person who has an issue that gets closed off from this. So we want people who are able to express and be dependent to some degree. And in the United States, at least, it, the, the notion of dependency is often gender-based. Genderized, I should say. If you want to put somebody down, if you want to minimize them, and especially with, with uh, women, it's, oh, she's just being a dependent female. Well, whenever you say just about anything, person is just this, you almost always are minimizing that person. That's totally wrong, totally unfair, and, and needs to be changed. Because the, the opposite is true. 
It's the ability to reach out, the willingness to reach out for support and comfort. That is a healthy position to be in. So in, in fact, in, to some degree, the machismo, the independent male, uh, is, 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 is a less health. I see some people smiling, especially the women smiling here. That's interesting. Uh, the, uh, is a less healthy person than the, what the person who is able to express these kinds of, of needs. Now, I don't have time today to go into this issue of m immature uh, dependence, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a specialized kind of it. It's really probably this, this dependency issue is a complex curve. And by the way, I should uh, point out that in par theory, we know the least about, of all the things that I've talked about up to this point, we know the least about this. This, is, this, this one has given us some trouble in measurement. Uh, so I'm not as confident about all the conclusions that I'm drawing for this as I am about the others. Um, so I'm drawing in, in part on what the theory says, but I don't have the same level of evidence for the dependency issue that I do for the other six that we've been talking about. Then, more recently, the, 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 uh, going back to the 1970s, those seven are things that we've been dealing with extensively. More recently, we've, we've come to realize that even before or along with the anger and other things, when you feel yourself to be rejected by the person who was so very important to you, one of the very first things that start to happen to us is we get anxious and we become insecure. We're only now beginning to measure internationally the notion of anxiety in the context of the rejection process. So far, all of our measures, I mean, all of our, the, the tests have shown that, in fact, anxiety is something that it really uh, is, is very important. So the reject, you can probably conclude pretty safely that anxiety and insecurity along with the other seven that we've been talking about, are universal consequences. The one at the bottom, the cognitive and perceptual distortions, we don't know a whole lot about yet either. But it seems to be very important, especially for children who have been seriously rejected for a period of time, but also for adults. It, it starts to, as, we, as you might guess from the concepts of, of um, uh, negative worldview, it gets into our head, and because of the insecurity and so forth, we become hypersensitive in relationships to the possibility that the person that we're with is going to reject us. We start looking consciously or unconsciously for signs that that person, we can't trust that relationship. We start thinking about relationships as being unsafe. So it gets into both perceptual and cognitive kinds of things in our heads. Some of you may be familiar with the notion of rejection sensitivity. Well, rejection sensitivity is exactly the form, uh, one of the forms of um, cognitive distortion that we're interested in, that we're talking about. And we have been studying that, and we know that the rejected child and the re rejected, the adult who remembers having been rejected as a child scores significantly higher on standard measures of rejection sensitivity. It's the heightened awareness of potential, overreacting to it, and anger. Those are the three components that, that, that are part of the rejection sensitivity process and many other things. Uh, another story comes to mind here about these, these, these perceptual uh, and cognitive distortions. Many years ago, with my, my children, uh, on a Sunday afternoon, we just finished all the chores that we had to do around the house and stuff like that. We went to the local ice cream parlor, a place called Kathy John's, and we were having ice cream, and a group of boys, uh, 12 year old probably boys they had just finished a soccer game and came in and they were standing in line to get their ice cream and another boy was late and so he came rushing in and there was a carpet on the floor that was kind of 
rumpled, and he tripped on the carpet and fell forward and hit the boy in front of him. The boy in front of him knew that that kid behind him intentionally hit him. And he was furious, and he was going to start a fight with that little boy. Something was going on in his readiness to respond with anger with something that was purely unintentional. And that's another part of this whole, re that's what makes re this rejection process so difficult, because there is this, this readiness to, to ambiguous situations, ambiguous comments, something that can possibly be interpreted in some negative way will be interpreted, even though it, the person who did it or said it had no intentions of having that be negative in any way whatsoever, but the, the rejected person automatically makes this assumption that it was, it was, it was intentional. So it, it changes the way that we think about the world and the way that we feel about the world and the way that we feel about ourselves. And the interesting thing is that so far we haven't found any population in the world where this kind of stuff fails to show up. It shows up in the same way everywhere. But there's more. Uh, very briefly, what I wanted to mention here was that, as I mentioned earlier, some very small number of people, and we're studying this right now, we have a, a population of about 12,000 people. Copers are hard to find. Coper, by the way, for us in, oh, my wife is telling me I'm going to have to <laughs> speed it up. Okay. Uh, copers are, are people who, for us, we talk about affective copers. When we talk about copers, we mean people who emotionally are doing okay psychologically, despite having experienced serious rejection. Cop those affective copers are very different from what we call instrumental copers. And these are people that are doing okay in their occupations. They're doing every okay in their workaday world. They may be, even be at the top of their profession. But emotionally, they're in pain. So we're, we're not dealing with the, the instrumental copers. We're dealing with the affective copers. And identifying those people who are seriously rejected but still psychologically healthy is, is, a, is a challenge. But we think we have a number of people internationally who, who meet this, and we're, we're trying to study those. So personality sub-theory, as you know then, says as the rejection process in increases, we're going to get an increase in the, these, these issues of psychological maladjustment, this collection of seven to 10 things that I've been talking about. Then there's another group of people up here called troubled. Now, those people are, some of those people are people whose psychological adjustment, they're having difficulties for reasons that have nothing to do with being rejected. So you and I can be psychologically messed up for a lot of reasons that not necessarily rejected. I'm not, so we don't want to conclude that all people who are psychologically distressed are, are, are feeling rejected. That's not necessarily the case. But what bothered me for years was why is it that some of these people, adults, uh, who come from loving families, show exactly the same cluster of psychological problems that the rejected child shows. And that became, that was a puzzle for me for a long time until one day, a colleague of mine sitting across the table from me was, she was totally distraught. She was sobbing, she was angry, she was going through a whole set of emotions about a relationship that, was, that had been fa that failed. This guy that she was desperately in love with dumped her, but he dumped her almost three years earlier, but she was still dealing with the pain of that. And as she talked and as she emoted, I, I found myself counting hostile aggression, 
in uh, the, uh, her own feelings, uh, and negative in self-esteem. She went through the, the whole bundle of things that we know to be true for the rejected child. But I knew in her case that she had not been, or thought I knew, because she had gone to school with my son, high school, and I knew her family. And so I, ha I thought that she had come from a loving relationship so in her, with her parents. And that's at that point where this light bulb went off, which is pretty obvious now, but it wasn't obvious to me at the, at the time. Of course, it isn't just parent-child, really. It isn't just rejection in, from parents. It's rejection at any point in our life with somebody who's so important to us that's going to trigger this same constellation, we call it the rejection syndrome, the same constellation of feelings that we've been describing here. And from that point on, uh, we've been uh, talking about interpersonal relationships uh, rather than simply parent-child relationships. Now, all this cycle, this cluster, this, this, this constellation of hurt then tends to lead, especially kids, off into different life directions from the kids who would raise with, with loving families. So worldwide, rejection tends to be associated with depression, depressed affect, uh, not uh, unipolar depression, not, not, not bipolar, that has the heritability component to it. It tends to be associated with conduct problems, behavior disorder, delinquency, and adult criminality. It tends to be associated with uh, substance abuse, drug, and alcohol. Here's something else as clinicians or social workers or educators or people working in the courts and whatnot that you should know. Dads are more implicated in the development of these problems than moms worldwide. Moms are there too, of course. It's just a matter of who is the better predictor. You need to start focusing a lot on not just mothers, your relationship that child, children may have with their mothers, but you need to begin to focus also on if there's a man in the kid's life, a father or a father figure, what's that relationship like? Because it's turning out that fathers are sometimes better predictors of outcome developmentally for kids than mothers are. Sometimes mothers are better predictors. So you know, that's, what, that's an issue. And some of you may be familiar with a project that Professor Carrasco and some of us here uh, and internationally uh, have just finished on what we call the International Father Acceptance Rejection Project. But I, again, I don't have time to, to, uh, to, to go into that. So uh, I don't, I've been emphasizing the, the rejection process. So let me just mention a little bit about you know, the love what happens with kids who, uh, and adults who feel uh, loved. Um, so pro-social behavior, kids who, who grow up in loving families are significantly more likely. By the way, everything I'm saying is a matter of degree. You know, it's the significant probability of this happening, not the inevitability of, of, of these things happening. So there's a greater likelihood of uh, pro-social behaviors of positive peer relations and the other things that you see uh, on the board there, on the screen. I also want to emphasize the fact that rejection isn't a mere epiphenomenon. It's something that actually goes into our brain. And we're now learning there's a huge biochemical, neurobiological, etc., even changes that happen in our body, that the experience of rejection, social, interpersonal rejection, lights up the same part of the brain that physical pain does. It's right in there. The, the fMRI, the, the functional magnetic resonance imagery studies are showing it lights up the same part of the brain. Children who were seriously rejected for a long period of time their brain chemistry, their brain structure is measurably different from the brain structure of children who are loved. It goes on and on and on. It is not just an emotional thing. It is wired into us neurologically, biochemically, and physically in our brains and what we become as human beings. 
And here are some of the things where the rejection process is implicated in a greater probability of cardiovascular and, and a whole range of medical problems like that. Rejection, serious rejection at any point in our life. Now, you're all thinking about yourself, I hope. And you're thinking about the people that you know. And if you're clinicians, you're thinking about clients that you may be dealing with or have dealt with. These are, I, I've been studying this, this sort of thing now for way over half a century. I have not yet found anything in human life that has as dramatic and, and consistent effects on humans everywhere as this experience of being loved or not loved by the people that are most important to us. It, now, and this is not our research here, now I'm going to talk a little bit about Corey Floyd's work, just very briefly. Because it's it, not just a matter of experiencing love, I use the word love, you know, being cared about, whatever, whatever, whatever the positive expression might be. But also, if you're able to do it, and this is, of course, difficult for people who are rejected to be able to, to reach out and be affectionate with other people, but know this, that there are benefits to you over and above any of the benefits of giving affection, over and above any of the benefits that you might have from receiving it. So it's a win-win situation. Give affection, hug, kiss, caress in appropriate ways, obviously. You don't want to go out there. You've got to be a little careful about some of these things that you do. But do these things as often as you can because it's, it also gets into uh, issues of brain chemistry, of physiology, neurobiology, as well as our emotions. So uh, the, 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 the thing that we're discovering now in the 21st century is that, you know, these really are biological issues that we're dealing with. Prior to that, we didn't know that. We thought that they were, at, we knew that at least they were psychological issues. Um, all right, benefits of affection given. And if you have interest in knowing more about, because it goes on, we have, 200 articles and 15 books and stuff, please visit our website. There's an article on the website called Introduction to Parental Acceptance Rejection Theory. And I want to invite you, if you're interested in this topic, if you want to find out more about it and the evidence and so forth, invite you to read it, read that article. And again, as you read that, think about yourself and the people that you know, and thank you very much. And I guess now we open it up for questions and answers. Yeah. I think we have now time for questions. Of ready? course. So, Ahora sí va. La debemos hacer con el micrófono para que los, los, las personas que están online... ¿No? Ahora se escucha, ¿no? Eh, bueno, pues venga, tiempo pa, para hacer cuestiones. Eh, si hay alguna, claro. Estupendo. I would like to know if you I don't think I don't think your microphone is working. Uh huh. No. Uh, I would like to know if through the, the investigation you found any difference in gender, like not independence or independence in in people, but if there's more rejection uh, towards women or 
and males, like females or males, uh, cross-cultural as well. Gender differences. The question is, are there, are there, do there tend to be gender differences? There are in some times. Um, and there also uh, seem to be uh, uh, sometimes differences in the way that people respond. Um, uh, there's some evidence, and, and, and I, by the way, I forgot to mention, I, my apologies, I, I should have brought into the discussion, we, we've done uh, 11 meta-analyses of over 100,000 people um, uh, trying to test the universality of the propositions of, of par theory, and I was going to build that in, and I totally forgot to, uh, to go very far, so I'll mention that now. Uh, there are, there are some, some gender differences both in the parenting side of things uh, and also in the response. But they, they are very small. They, they're statistically significant, but this, they're, they're really so small that I am somewhat reluctant to, to, to emphasize them very much, especially from a clinical or any kind of practical perspective. Um, and we're just now learning, we're, we're, at this very moment, uh, back in Connecticut, we're doing a, a meta-analysis of uh, about 100,000 people, um, 200 studies, uh, looking at gender differences, uh, boys and girls' uh, responses to, to this. So uh, it looks like there are going to be some gender differences, but we're not quite sure exactly what they're going to look like yet. So please uh, keep reading uh, the Rohner Center website, uh, and that's going to show up very, some of the results are going to show up very soon. Uh, there. Thank you for your question. This is an excellent question. Hello? Is it working? Yes. Well, first, uh, thanks for coming. Okay. And, well, my question is, I don't know if you already answered uh, that question, but uh, it is if, if someone has been rejected, mm -hmm. he always responds with danger to a situation, or if someone responds with anger, it means that he has been rejected before. <laughs> Interesting question. Interesting question. Uh, can you all, did you all hear the question? Do I need to repeat it or, or uh, okay. Yeah, I if someone is rejected, there, there's going to be anger in there someplace, probably. Now, it can sometimes also be, you know, sometimes people will feel like it's not appropriate to show anger. And again, there's, there, there seems to be some gender differences there. In, 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 in the socialization of children. Sometimes girls are told, no, it's not nice girls don't get angry. That's not, we don't find that so much anymore, but we used to find that uh, a fair amount. So there, but can be, the anger can be bottled up. Uh, but it's, if you're an, an, an astute clinician or have some good measures like ours, uh, you can get people to identify that there, there, there is anger now. If somebody is angry, does it necessarily mean that they're rejected? Well, no, I, it, it, it just depends entirely on the context. But if someone is angry and you identify that they have impaired self-esteem and there seems to be some emotional unresponsiveness issues and, you know, you go through this, as I did with my colleague when she was sitting across the table from me, I found myself, my hands under the table, counting off one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, she's got that club. Then you know that that person has, no, in, you know, in, in all likelihood, that that person has some significant rejection issues that may or may not want to talk about them yet. So as clinicians or whatever, people working with people in whatever context, if you know they've been rejected, you know something about what they're f likely to be feeling. If you know something about what somebody has been, is feeling and they shows this cluster of stuff, bingo, you may want to go over here and find out what goes on in their relationship, or you may want to stay away from it, depending on the context you know, of, what, of what you intend to do. But knowing one is a pretty darn good predictor about the other one. But not just one, not, not anger by itself won't do it. It has to be a cluster, th this particular cluster of, of things, as far as we can tell. I think, did I see a hand up there? No? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, well, thanks. I, I think your mic is off again. I think it's on. Okay. I'll do my best. <laughs> thanks for coming. Um, I, I was thinking of um, 
different families where some of the members feel rejected and whereas other members don't. Um, let's suppose they haven't be, been rejected object, objectively, right? Um, so what do you think uh, may have happened? Why some of them, some children in that family uh, feel rejected, they've been rejected, whereas others don't? Uh, what could be the reason, according to your experience? Could it be just biology? Because they, they are probably, um, they've been treated in the same way uh, by the same people. So what could happen in that case? Yeah. Uh, you and I, we, we can grow up in, even though they're biologically the same people, they can be utterly different families that we grow up in depending on the age differences, depending on the gender differences, depending on life circumstances of the parent. So uh, depending on the characteristics of the child, some children are temperamentally or other things have some sort of disability that makes them more difficult to parent than other kids. So a whole range of things can affect uh, children's feelings that one child in a family can feel very loved and another child can feel very rejected. But there's no simple answer to that, it just depends on the, on so much on the context of what's, what, what's going on in that family. But it's for that reason that in our research, we always just deal with one, one child at a time per family. So we don't get too much, unless we're interested in, in uh, differences within families. Is there anything else that I can tell you about, about, about yourself if you want to hear something more about yourself. I hope by now that you've all thought about yourself and find yourself here someplace. Yes. Well, um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your lecture. Uh, you. It's been very interesting. And um, I want to, to propose uh, three, um, three aspects to, to comment. Um, one of them, the first one, uh, is uh, just curiosity. At the, the beginning of um, your exposition, you said that um, the uh, uh, untouchables are uh, the, the, the more um, uh, the cultural group less reacting. Uh, the untouchables, less yeah, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, what about the, the more reacting uh, cultural group in, the, in family, in close it, relationships? Yeah, in the, in the, in the village, where we, the community where we worked in West Bengal, the, the high caste Brahmin, it was a Brahmin dominated village, uh, and the Brahmins are the political and economic and in every other sense of the word, the elite. And there was significantly higher forms of rejection, more serious rejection among them than among the untouchables. Even though the untouchables were the ones who were starving, they were dying, uh, and there, there are a variety of cultural reasons, uh, cultural things that are going on that help to explain the difference there. Not that the Brahmins were rejecting parents, just that there's a greater incidence of, of rejection among the Brahmin families, the high caste, the high caste families, all of them, but the Brahmins in particular, than the, than the untouchables. This comes as a shock to some of our Indian colleagues. In fact, some of them get almost angry that there could be anything that is better among the untouchables than among the high caste or among the Brahmins. It's impossible for something like that to occur, but I'm sorry, you know, it did. Yeah. If you want to know more about that, uh, my colleague and I wrote a book, uh, Manjusri Chaki Sirkar, called Women and Children in a Bengali Village. So you can, yeah, it's, it's, it's on our website here if you, if you uh, have an interest in, in pursuing that. Uh -huh. Nancy, I think, she had two, I think she had three questions that she wanted to ask. She had three questions. And, uh, well, uh, perhaps uh, uh, the other two, uh, two I, I, I can't um, uh, reformulate as uh, one. Is, uh, you said um, couples uh, with reaction look uh, like or uh, better behave as uh, resilient people, uh, mm, and they show uh, a good adjustment. 
but uh, in their deep, they are in pain. Oh, yes, uh, they are in pain. Yes, they yeah, are. Yes. To, They're to, just not in as much pain as a rejected person typically is. So, oh, yes, I, I need to emphasize that. The copers are not people who are pain-free. They are people, uh, they, they hurt, but they don't hurt. If this is a continuum of no hurt to great hurt, they're not up here at the great hurt end. They tend to be sort of mid-level or a little lower, uh, whereas, but they're still not as psychologically well-adjusted. Typically, some may be, but not very many, as people who were raised in loving families. Yeah, but my question uh, is if uh, you have found um, uh, some possibility to use the resilient aspect of the life uh -huh. to overcome the uh, reaction problem, and yeah. uh, if uh, so, uh, in in uh, what ways? If I understand your, correct, your your question correctly, that's part of the reason why we're we're trying so hard to understand the coping process, because if we can find out what it is that helps these people to cope, then maybe we can take that information and work yeah. with people who are not doing as well and let mm -hmm. uh, help them to become more resilient and more coping, uh, yeah. capable of coping. That's our goal. That's where we want to go. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and uh, finally, um, you said um, that uh, reacted to people uh, shows um, uh, intolerance to, to ambiguity in, the, in relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, have you found also that uh, they are requiring a continuous reassurement uh, of, uh, to be accepted? Uh, I'm not sure I followed that. Would you say that again, please? Or, or Miguel, could you? Yes. As, um, have you found um, or not that uh, uh, if um, a rejected people Mm, they need a continuous reassurement mm -hmm. uh, uh, of, uh, to be uh, accepted in yes. order to overcome their, their intolerance to ambiguity. Yes. 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 Rejected people need constant reassurance. My wife is laughing because it, yeah. it, it, it kind of fits. And, uh, and this is a solution, uh -huh. really? And it is a, a solution, a working solution, an effective one, or is a way to stimulate the dependence? It, if, is it, if, well, I mean, it, it helps you get by day to day. It, ba <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it bounces. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to get Love into a therapy it. session here, don't we? Love it. <laughs> okay, okay. And Nancy, do you? Do you <clears throat> uh, my remark was simply to um, emphasize that if there are people who are interested in uh, how to use the measures that Ron has developed, and especially the ones that uh, Miguel has translated into Spanish, that they should contact um, Miguel for information about how to get this and how to um, obtain our um, books that Ron has uh, written about these different topics. And uh, there, there are different websites beyond this that Miguel can, can give you. So I think time's over. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. Sure. Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, when you put me on, on this topic, I'll be here all day. Thank you. Uh, could, you uh, could you please explain? Can, can you? Uh, could you please? Uh, it's something's not working there. Could you please explain uh, the cognitive consequences of rejection? The, the cognitive consequences of uh, re uh, rejection. The cognitive consequences of rejection. Yes. Uh, you mean the, the cognitive distortions that yeah. tend to be associated with rejection? Um, beyond what, what the slide shows. Okay. 
this goes on for a while, so I'm, try, I'm going to try to, you know, to, to abbreviate it a little bit. Um, it, it, it has a fundamental impact on the way that, that people, uh, rejected people, think about themselves, think about the world, think about relationships. They tend to be distorted uh, in the sense that other people would not, would not agree with this. It, it has to do with this, as we've been commenting on, like the intolerance for ambiguity. It's not really an intolerance per se, but it's, it, it's the ex expecting negative things, looking for negative things, perceiving them when they're not there, or in any case, they're not really intended. It has to, it's social cognitive kinds of, uh, it, the process, it's, it's the way that we process uh, physical and verbal and symbolic input mm -hmm. um, becomes, and I don't know of any other word other than distorted. I mean, I, I, I can, uh, I don't want to go too far in, in, in some of the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the language that some of the cognitive people use here, because I, then I have to explain what the terms mean and stuff like that. But so, I, so I guess I'm going to have to say, this is about as close as I can get to an explanation of, of, of this cognitive cognition issue at the moment. But I invite you to read uh, where I, I go in somewhat more detail, the article that's on our website called Introduction to Parental Acceptance Rejection Theory. There you'll find a number of references and you'll find an explanation of some of the important things, and certainly not all of them, because much more work has been done. Uh, and this is not the work so much that we do on some of the cognitive implications of, 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 of the rejection process. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm taking uh, a lot of the research of other people and, uh, and building it into part theory. Mm -hmm. So with my apologies for being kind of vague on, on, on more detail. Thank you. So I think time's over. So thank you so much, Professor Rohner, for being here. It well, uh, has been a great honor and pleasure. So you will be, whatever you want, welcome to our university. So thank, <laughs> thank you. you so much. Well, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. I Chagra appreciate it.